In the middle of the Syrian desert is without doubt the most beautiful and magnificent of the Syrian historic sites, Palmyra. Once dubbed the Pride of the Desert, Palmyra was a vital stop for caravans crossing the Syrian desert. Palmyra was mentioned in the Old Testament as being fortified by Solomon and it flourished in Roman times. For the history amateur, Syria is a wonderland. Imposing or discreet, historical ruins are an integral part of the landscape. Palmyra is one of those mystical sites that make the trip to Syria worthwhile. Travel from Damascus, taking the direct road through the steppe, and visitors will arrive in this oasis, where the clearness of the sky, the warm colour of stone and the lushness of palm groves combine in a most unique way. At an equal distance from the Mediterranean and the Euphrates, the site benefited from two natural factors, the presence of water and a passage point on one of the routes from the sea to the river. These characteristics weren't decisive enough, however, to make of Palmyra, during a specific period, a first-rate commercial power. The extensive ruins at Palmyra reveal the network plan of the ancient city. The Corinthian order marks almost all the monuments, but the influence of Mesopotamia and Iran is also clearly evident. The art found on monuments and tombs also reflects the influences of the surrounding Roman and Persian empires. As UNESCO put it, the art and architecture of Palmyra, standing at the crossroads of several civilizations, married Greco-Roman techniques with local traditions and Persian influences. Called Tadmor by the Arabs, Palmyra appeared for the first time in the second millennium BC in the archives of Mari and in an Assyrian text. It was also mentioned in the Bible as a part of Solomon's territory. The Seleucids practically ignored Tadmor and it became independent. It flourished through trade with Persia, the Indian subcontinent and the Arabian Peninsula. In 41 BC, it had become rich enough to attract the Romans and Antony attempted to occupy it, but failed because of the Palmyrians escaping to the other side of the Euphrates. It was fully occupied by the Romans under Tiberius, Augustus' successor, and was integrated into the province of Syria from 14 to 37 AD. During the next 100 years of Roman rule, Palmyra prospered greatly as a trade route, linking the East Asian empires of Persia, India, China and the Parthians, who were Rome's enemy for a long time. They managed this by keeping good ties with both the Romans and the Parthians. When Hadrian visited Palmyra, he was quite enthralled by it, and he named it Palmyra Hadriana, and proclaimed it a free city. The leader Septimus Odenet became quite favoured by Rome and was appointed by the Emperor Valerian as consul and governor of the province of Syria Phoenicia, which Palmyra had been transferred to. A few years later, Valerian was captured and murdered by the Sasanian Persians, and in redemption, Odenet campaigned as far as the Sasanian capital, Ctesiphon. Palmyra's greatest days, however, were after the murder of Odenat, when his wife Zenobia started ruling Palmyra on behalf of her son, Vabalaf. Zenobia, with the help of her prime minister, extended Palmyrian power to the west and took over Bosra and occupied as far as Egypt. She then headed for the north and attempted to take Antioch. This sudden expansion posed a threat for the Romans and after two years of being flexible, Aurelian retaliated and took back Antioch, Emesa and then Palmyra itself. Zenobia tried to escape, but was captured and was taken back to Rome as a prisoner. After this, Rome kept a close eye on Palmyra, and it was forced to become a military area and let go of its reputation as a trade centre. 
It was expanded under Emperor Diocletian to harbour Roman legions and it was walled in defence from the Sasanian threat. Later, in the Byzantine period, a few churches were built and added to the much-ruined city. It was then taken by the Arabs under Khalid ibn al-Walid, who was leader of the Arab army under the Caliph Abu Bakr. The outstanding universal value of Palmyra has long been a recognized fact. In the 17th century, P. de la Valle, Tavernier and Halifax gave enthusiastic descriptions of it. In the 18th century, the voyage of Dawkins and Wood in 1753 and Volney in 1787 revealed by the publications which they gave rise to the splendor of the ruins of Palmyra, which exerted through these means a decisive influence on the evolution of neoclassical architecture and modern urbanization. The Temple of Bel is set on an artificial mound that dates back to the second millennium BC, and it's almost sure that this site has always been the site of a shrine. This sanctuary is walled and has a courtyard in the centre, and in the centre of the courtyard is the cella, which is the original place of worship. Bel was identified by the Greeks as Zeus and as Jupiter by the Romans, and was lord and master of the universe, creator of the world and leader of the gods. The Great Court, 210 metres long and 205 metres wide, was enclosed within an impressive precinct, the Peribolos. Inside this court, built for the gathering of worshippers, the cella housing the deity was to be found. This general plan, a feature of many religious buildings of the region, is called Syrophoenician. The temple marks the inclusion of Palmyra within the Roman cultural sphere. The Peribolos had windows at regular points with an entrance underneath the peripheral wall and the portico, probably through which animals were led on the way to sacrifice, performed on an altar placed on the cella. Palmyra offers the consummate example of an antique urbanized complex for the most part protected with its large public monuments such as the Agora, the theatre and the temples. Near these, the inhabited quarters are preserved and outside the fortified precinct are immense necropolises. The city was one of the largest artistic centres of the Middle East from the 1st through the 3rd centuries. Palmyra and art, which the great museums of the world now vie for, unites the forms of Greco-Roman art with indigenous elements and Iranian influences in a strongly original style. Two of the stone beams of the peristyle are preserved at the entrance. The first represents Aglibol standing before an altar covered in fruit. The temple is surrounded by a peristyle, a colonnade supporting capitals of the Corinthian order. As was probably the case for the column capitals of the Parabolos, those surrounding the cella were covered in gold and silver. The vast building heritage the high artistic quality of Palmyran sculptors, as well as marvellous romantic views of ancient ruins on the desert, create here a touristic paradise, which is still unspoiled due to the strong policies of the Syrian authorities, which forbid modern development on the archaeological site. There's much to see at the site today, including several temples dedicated to Aramean, Babylonian and Mesopotamian deities, the ancient ruins are a World Heritage Site and are one of the most popular tourist destinations in Syria. The monumental arch was erected under the reign of Septimius Severus in order to hide the 30 degree angle created by the second change in direction of the Great Colonnade. 
an architectural solution was found by making a double facade with three openings. One would face the Bell Temple, the other the central section of the Great Colonnade. The richness of decoration is particularly remarkable. In Palmyra, the variety of well-preserved vaults and arches provide a rare opportunity to study and form an opinion about the transition and development of the local building trade. The limited impact of the Romans until the second century created here a chance to evaluate the origins and establish the real level of the skill of local masons. The famous monumental arch which spans 6.9 meters and was built at the beginning of the third century from an engineering point of view should not be recognized as an arch. Its main and side arches were constructed as structures of interacted crosseted voussoirs, mounted with rebated joints and locked with a large double beam acting as a keystone. The application of these solutions allows us to recognize this structure as corbelled. Contrary to the 2nd century monuments, the arches of the 3rd century were rather bland. At that time, at least eight large arches were constructed with the use of regular voussoirs. The development of the building trade, which occurred in Palmyra at the turn of the 2nd and 3rd centuries, can explain this dramatic change. The characteristic features of the Palmyran landscape are columns and colonnades, both those originally preserved and those newly re-erected. Their skyline forms a wonderful view, but columns alone are not able to create a three-dimensional image of the town's monuments. The Great Colonnade can be divided into three main parts, all situated between the Tetrapylon and the Monumental Arch. The street was deliberately not paved in order to let camels use it. Because of the proximity of a number of official and monumental constructions, this section constituted the most prestigious and magnificent part of the Great Colonnade. The Great Colonnade doesn't show a rectilinear axis. The tetrapylon and the monumental arch mark changes in orientation, the consequence of pre-existing urban growth. The columns, which are sober in style, supported rectangular blocks called consoles, set in perpendicular fashion. On these were placed the statues of the nobility and officials of the city. Perhaps the most striking construction at Palmyra, the tetrapylon marks the second pivot in the route of the colonnaded street. It consists of a square platform bearing at each corner a tight grouping of four columns. Each of the four groups of pillars supports 150,000 kilos of solid cornice. A pedestal at the center of each quartet originally carried a statue. Only one of the 16 pillars is of the original pink granite. The rest are a result of reconstruction carried out from the 1960s onwards by the Syrian Antiquities Department. Palmyra is a well-renowned World Heritage Site due to its ancient monuments. Recent studies have brought to light locally developed building techniques. This discovery is represented by the sequence of gradual changes and modifications in building techniques. At present, conservation and proper exposition of endangered architectural remains is crucial for protection, not only of the magnificent monuments, but also of the intellectual values utilized for their construction. The case of the Palmyra architectural remains has considerably broadened the issue of the Middle East cultural heritage protection. Though the famous ruins of Palmyra seem to be eternal, there's the constant process of limestone deterioration, especially on remnants exposed after excavations. The tetrapylon is an imposing structure, which, like the monumental arch, conceals a change in the direction of the colonnaded street, as well as providing a suitably grand visual counterbalance to the bell sanctuary.
A small building, considered to be the city council or senate, can be found behind the theatre. It's a large rectangular court encircled by four porticos. This was, during the 2nd century AD, the most prestigious part of the city. Excavations were carried out here under the supervision of Henri Seyrig. Carved blocks set perpendicular to the walls or attached to columns supported some 200 statues, representing the officials and the nobility of the city. One enters the theatre through a vaulted passageway leading to the orchestra. The Sinai front includes five doors, the central one being the royal one. There are three vaulted passages, one central and two on the sides. The stage measures 48 metres in length and 10 metres in depth. There are 12 rows of seats because the absence of further foundations determining if the theatre's construction was ever completed or if the highest rows of seats were of wood are still debated topics. Much of the architecture, structure, design, buildings and the plays shown in the Roman theatre were influenced by the Greek theatre. The semicircular design of the building enhanced the natural acoustics of the theatre. The entertainment available in the Roman theatre included mime, orations, dance, choral events and different types of plays including farce, tragedy and comedy. The Sanctuary of Nebo is another important monument of Palmyra. The son of the Mesopotamian bell Marduk, Nebo was the god of oracles, wisdom and writing. Identified with Apollo, he was very popular among the population of Palmyra. The excavation of the sanctuary was carried out by a Syrian expedition in the 1960s. The construction of this religious complex started in the 1st century AD, but lasted until the 3rd. Rich Palmyran families provided the financial backing. Its plan recalls that of the Bell Sanctuary, a courtyard surrounded by a peripheral wall with a portico inside the precinct. The walls form a trapeze. Though the cella also had crenellations and a terraced roof, influences of the Roman world are more apparent. Of this religious complex, only the temple podium and the column bases of the portico survived. Near the house tomb called the Funerary Temple, the transverse colonnade leads to the military camp established under Diocletian. After the fall from power of Zenobia in 273, the border between Sassanid Persians and Romans was in effect drawn on the Habur River, an affluent of the Euphrates, its confluence located northeast of Palmyra. The eastern frontier of the empire therefore had to be heavily guarded the site contains constructions from this period of the Roman Empire, as well as older elements reinserted within later editions. The Alat Sanctuary was built on the main street. Alat, the goddess, was worshipped by the Arab tribes of Palmyra. She was a deity protecting the nomads and was identified with the Syrian Atagartes and Athene. As she was seen as a warrior goddess, her temple was naturally placed within the camp's limits. The present ruins of this sanctuary are from a construction dating back to the 2nd century AD, 
with modifications in the 3rd century. A door frame and lintel, as well as some ornate striated columns, are all that are left of the temple. The Praetorian Way leads past a gate with three openings to the Camps Forum, a large square, then the Temple of Emblems at the summit of the stairs. After a vestibule, one entered a hall 60 metres long and 12 metres wide, then onto the cella. The view toward the city of Palmyra from this sanctuary are spectacular. A wealthy caravan centre, alternately independent from and under submission to the rule of Rome, Palmyra was the object during the 2nd and 3rd centuries of vast embellishments. The cemeteries of Palmyra encircle the city just outside the city walls. They consist of two main sites, the main necropolis to the southwest of the city and the Valley of the Tombs to the west. Each cemetery is dominated by a particular type of burial. Numerous tombs appeared, many with temple facades, their orgy of construction fueled by a period of unparalleled privilege and prosperity. The various necropolises lay beyond the limits of the city, to the north, to the west and to the south. Apart from individual burials signalled by a stele, there were three types of collective tombs for the affluent, in which the dead were mummified or wrapped in strips of cloth. The funerary towers are the oldest. Their construction dates from the period spanning 9 BC to 128 AD, but they were secondarily used during a longer time. Their architecture evolved towards a more functional use of place and a richer interior decoration, Palmyra has 150 tower tombs. The basic plan of the funerary tower consists of a foundation platform, floors reached by a staircase and courses of loculi, superimposed cavities made to receive the bodies. Tombs were first combined with towers after they were independently built. Palmyra's burials are unique. Situated outside the city walls, they show the changes in burial practice over the city's history and reflect Palmyrian beliefs in life after death. Generally speaking, cities like Palmyra had a two-tiered structure consisting of an acropolis around which the city of the living developed and necropolises around the urban area where the city of the dead existed. The ancient city of Palmyra is considered to have had such a structure. The tombs of Palmyra evolved from tower tombs to underground tombs and then to house tombs over time in a somewhat staggered chronological order. The intimidating Fakreddin al Mane Castle, which stands on top of a mountain to the west of Palmyra's vestiges, was built in the 16th century. It was surrounded by a moat leaving no access to it except by a narrow bridge. The Arab fort was for a long time associated with the Lebanese emir Fakir al-Din, but it seems to be earlier, since 12th to 13th century pottery and architectural elements have been retrieved there. From the top of the hill, a spectacular view of the archaeological site and the modern city is guaranteed. An oasis in the Syrian desert 
northeast of Damascus, Palmyra contains the monumental ruins of a great city that was one of the most important cultural centers of the ancient world. From the 1st to the 2nd century, the art and architecture of Palmyra, standing at the crossroads of several civilizations, married Greco-Roman techniques with local traditions and Persian influences.